Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. Now, what are the five points I want to get across? First, I want you to understand that Earth and life have changed. It hasn't always been like this, even here on Earth in the past. Second, I want you to understand that the idea, the understanding that there's something that has to be explained, there's evolution to explain, there's change of life through time to explain, goes back way before Darwin. Third, I want you to understand that Darwin himself was a geologist the first half of his career. Now, you can't blame anybody who gets on, who discovers, makes a really interesting insight, has a really interesting insight into the history of life on Earth. You can't blame him for changing careers halfway through. And he certainly did that, but at the beginning, he, his training basically was a geologist. Fourth, I want you to understand that evolution is fast. Paleontologists have given to the science of evolution the notion that evolution was slow. And I think that's wrong. As a process, evolution is fast. And I want to, I'll talk more about that. And then finally, we get to the evolution of whales. And I want you to take away from that the really interesting <coughs> understanding that this was backward. When I talk to my mother, bless her, about what I do and what I study, she eventually says, but I thought evolution came out of the sea onto the land. And I say, yes, mother, this is backwards. And that's what makes it especially interesting, and I'll come back to that at the end. Here you see an excavation from this spring, from March and April in Egypt, University of Michigan ex excavation, of a big fossil whale. And the first thing people ask me in Egypt or here, what was a whale doing in the desert? <laughs> The desert has changed. This used to be, when the whales lived here, trust me, this was a beautiful, shallow sea. That we find whales here now in the desert is simply because to find them we need a place that was sea then, but doesn't have any water or vegetation covering it now. So that's why we work where there are deserts today. But that doesn't mean they were always deserts. And this, all of the sediments, all of the strata that you see outlined here and back up through and back up through here were deposited in a shallow sea that occupied this for tens of millions of years, about 40 million years ago. So things change. Now we know other planets are different, but some people think ours has always been the same. They're wrong. If we look at the oxygen and carbon isotope records back through the last 65 million years, we can easily divide the Earth into two main phases during this interval of time. The first is a time when oxygen isotopes here tell us that the Earth was on the order of 7, 8, 10 degrees warmer than today on average. And then abruptly, rapidly, at the end of what we call the Eocene, we go into, we shift from a, from a greenhouse Earth, as we call it, to an icehouse Earth. And that's when glaciers started to uh, 
cover so much of the surface of the earth, cover the poles, and even at times in the last couple million years cover much of the northern continents. So the earth has changed in that major way. Now there's another thing I might say while I have this diagram up. I want to explain how differently paleontologists think than biologists do. We're friends, we're colleagues, we work together, but we think a little differently. And that's partly because biologists see what's here today. The top of this chart is today. And so we can study the distribution of oxygen isotopes, carbon isotopes today. We can study things living today. But if a biologist wants to know what happened back here when archaic mammals lived, they're really triangulating back from the present, back from the present, trying to focus and see what happens here. Paleontologists go back here. We go back in time, not always perfectly, but we go back. If this is the problem we're interested in, we go back and study time and form and try to trace things step by step by step through time to convince ourselves that something has happened and to understand what happened. But also, the reason to work back in time is to be able to link it directly with things that help us understand the physical environment, carbon isotopes, oxygen, oxygen isotopes, at the very same time from the very same geological strata. So we go back and work back in time. It's harder, we see less. There are big advantages to working up here today. But the best of all is if we work together and combine what we see and then we can make a fuller picture both of the present, I think, and of the past. But I want you to understand that it's divided into three main parts. What we call Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. And what do those mean? Words usually, if you dig deep enough, mean something. Have you ever been to the Detroit Zoo? Yes. <laughs> Paleozoic, ancient life, ancient animals, literally. Mesozoic, middle animals, Cenozoic, recent animals. And then in my part of paleontology, we subdivide the recent here, the Cenozoic, into the Paleocene. Scene here is the same scene as here. Paleocene, the ancient recent. The dawn recent. The oligo recent is the poor recent. The myo recent is the middle recent, and so forth up to the present day. That's how a geologist tells time. Now it turns out that the same evidence that led us to build up a geological time scale is exactly the evidence that Darwin and others in the 19th century were trying to explain with natural selection and other theories about how evolution works. These are the observations. If you go back to 1500, Leonardo da Vinci already understood that fossils are the remains of once living organisms. Italy, the Alps are full of fossils. And it didn't take too much comparison to convince yourself that the things living on the seashore and the things found in the Alps were so similar they must be related. So that's when the story really starts. In 1616, a man named Fabio Colonna recognized shark's teeth, fossil shark's teeth, which were called tongue stones in those days, as the remains of, of as, as perfectly similar to living sharks and, and the remains of dead sharks, or we would say now extinct sharks. Robert Hooke, famous for inventing the, mic the microscope, studied shells and petrified wood in microscopic detail and showed that they're just like shells and petri- and recent wood today. Again, reinforcing the idea that these are the remains of once living organisms, stone remnants of once living organisms. Now here's where we get to the physics in the talk. 1669, a man named Nicholas Steno 
published a book called Prodromus, et cetera, et cetera. I just abbreviated it here, Prodromus, on the original horizontality and temporal superposition of sedimentary rocks. Rivers carry sediments to the sea, to lakes, anywhere where the sediment can be caught, and they deposit it when the sediment spreads out in thin sheets and falls upon what was there before. What? Where's the physics in this? Gravity. Gravity. <laughs> See, I did it. What this means is that we can see layer by layer by layer what was deposited before, what was deposited after, and we know the direction of time. We know the axis of time in this. And this becomes important later, not so important for Steno, though he knew about fossils, but it becomes important later when more had been studied about the fossils and their relation to the horizontal bedding and the stratigraphic superposition and more could then be said about the change of fossils through time. Now in France in 1779, the Comte de Buffon wrote a book on the Époque de la Terre talking about <coughs> transformation of organisms. He could see already in the fossil record that maybe things have changed. Erasmus Darwin, Darwin's grandfather, wrote a book called Zoonomia in which he claimed, didn't have so much evidence really, but he had clearly enough to give him the idea that all warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament. That's 1794. 1795, James Hutton wrote a book, a very famous book in geology called The Theory of the Earth that ends with the phrase, no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end expanding our notion of geological time, earth history, far beyond what we infer from reading the book of Genesis. Now there were reactions to all of this, and William Paley is the most famous of these. His Natural Theology, a book that Darwin studied avidly when he was thinking of going into the clergy, Natural theology is a reaction to the literature on evolution and a claim that a watch must have a maker, and this is current debate, of course, too. In 1809 in France, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck published his Philosophie, Philosophie Zoologique about transformation of species but also increasing complexity up through the fossil record. Georges Cuvier, again in France, wrote in the introduction to a, a, a five-volume tome about fossil mammals and other vertebrates. The introductory volume really is called Revolution du Globe. Fossils alone show successive epochs in formation of the globe, so things aren't the same up through time. William Smith mapped the geology of much of England, and he did it by establishing faunal succession, the order of fossils here, say in Ann Arbor, the order of fossils in the next place he visited, say Jackson, now he's working in England, of course, not Michigan, but all across the country he established the vertical succession of fossils in the rocks that enclosed them and then linked the rocks together by their fossil content. This we call faunal succession and correlation. If the sequences of fossils in one place were different from those in another place, of course they are different in the sense that no single one is complete, no single section is ever complete, but if the orders were reversed, we wouldn't be able to match them up. But they aren't. One of the incredible discoveries of the 18th and 19th centuries is that the sequence of fossils with its gaps in place A can be stretched to match that in place B, but the vertical succession is always the same. They are always sampled from the same succession. And that's when we started to have a geological time scale def def 
naming the older ones Paleozoic and the middle ones Cenozoic, uh, Mesozoic and the recent ones Cenozoic, and then subdividing that and subdividing it and subdividing it, and we're still subdividing it today as we study change through time in ever finer detail. So this goes back to 1815. Charles Lyell in 1830, 32, wrote a three-volume work, Principles of Geology. Darwin took the first volume with him on the voyage of the Beagle. The second and I believe the third were sent out to him while he was sailing. And he talked about a long history of the earth, again, not a short biblical one. Modernization of faunas through time and he, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, introduced the term evolution in the sense that we talk about it today. It's always been an unrolling and unfolding. It's been used to, de to describe the ontogen ontogeny or the growth of a, an animal, an organism through time, but in the sense that we talk about it today of change of life through time, that goes back to Lyell in 1830. And Darwin is just putting his foot on the beagle and setting off to learn about the world himself. So all of this is background for Darwin. He sailed on the Beagle from 1831 to 1836. Five, five years he was in South America and then eventually went all the way around the earth, around the world, and came back to England in 1836. As you can imagine, a person just out of college going on a five-year tour of the world learns a lot, and Darwin did. I felt that way about two years in Malawi. I can only imagine what Darwin felt about seeing the whole world in five years. Now, when Darwin got back, Adam Sedgwick published the name Paleozoic as part of the geological time scale, and very quickly other colleagues in England added the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic to the time scale. So this was already happening at the time when Darwin was first formulating his theory of natural selection. In 1859, of course, everything changed when Darwin published a big explanation and defense of natural selection as a mechanism, a natural mechanism, for producing the kind of change we see through the geological record. The key thing about what's different about Darwin and, say, Lamarck here at the top of the chart is Darwin viewed this as a population process and Lamarck viewed it as something that individuals do and then they pass on to their, to their uh, offspring. There's a, a subtle difference but a very important one and that's the key thing about Darwin. Now, what about Darwin as a geologist? Here's a third book that was published this year by Sandra Herbert, The History of, uh, uh, History of Darwin, titled Charles Darwin, Geologist. Cornell Press, 485 pages, and I've read most of this one. I'm not quite to the end of it yet. But to try to explain what I mean when I say Darwin was a geologist, I've listed here in two slides, this is the first, his works of book length or monograph length, his major works in other words. And they start in 1839 with the journal of, of his research into the geology and natural history, etc., visited by the HMS Beagle, and this is what in popular we, we have all read in, in popular form or retitled as The Voyage of the Beagle. 1842, Structure and Distribution of Coral Reefs, first part of the geology of The Voyage of the Beagle, that's the subtitle. 1844, Geological Observations on Volcanic Islands, that's the second part of the geology of The Voyage of the Beagle. 1846, observation, Geological Observations on South America, that's the third volume of the geology of The Voyage of the Beagle. Uh, 1851, he published two monographs, one on the living uh, barnacles, particular kind of barnacles, and with that a monograph on the fossils of the same kind of barnacles. And then in 1854, a second monograph on the rest of the barnacles and with it a monograph on the fossils of that part. 
of, bar of the barnacles. And then finally, uh, I'm trying to remember how this last 1854 is different from the previous one. I've, oh, well, the, the first is the living and the second is the fossils again. So contrast this where I've got the geology in blue and the biology in green with the second slide. These are Darwin's biology publications after the or from starting with the origin of species. 1862, uh, orchids, domestication, descent of man, expression of emotions, movement and habits of climbing plants, insectivorous plants, cross and self-fertilization, flowers on different forms of flowers, formation of vegetable mold through the action of worms. If you visit Darwin's down, residence, downhouse, you still see the worm stones, the stones that he set in the ground to measure what the worms were doing to the soil and how rapidly they were making soil. Uh, and you can still go see those today sitting, I suppose, right where he left them. And then in 1882, Darwin died. So you can see the second half of his career was very much as a, as a uh, very forward-thinking biologist trying to understand the implications of natural selection. If the origin of species is such a Bible of evolution, how many illustrations does it have? Have you read it recently? Do you know? Well, I asked this question 30 years ago when I gave an evening lecture at Harvard. <laughs> And in the front row was Steve Gould. <laughs> and Steve threw me completely off because he's not one to miss a question, and he immediately said, two. Oh dear, I wouldn't have asked the question if I thought he was going to say two, because of course there's only one. <laughs> and that's this. The time scale, so here you see Darwin thinking like a paleontologist. The time scale, the vertical axis, is time here in thousands of generations. So this isn't exactly a geological time scale. It's not that long, but nonetheless it's organized the way we think. The abscissa on the bottom is form. It's unscaled here, and that's never very satisfactory in my view. So we can't tell exactly what he meant by this diagram. It isn't a real example, but it's a picture of what in his mind he envisioned evolution to be doing through time. And I'll emphasize that it's not all change. This is changing, yes, and this is branching and changing, but many lines are persisting or are persisting for a while and going extinct. So there's a lot of what today we call stasis in this as well as gradual step-by-step -step change through time. My interest when I started here as a beginning assistant professor was maybe not explicitly to redraw this diagram or to test this diagram or to try to see this in the rocks, but nonetheless that's what I did. I wasn't thinking quite so theoretically, but I really had the question in my mind of uh, how can we see pictures like this in the fossil record and be able to scale them. Now, what do we mean by evolution on a time scale that we can relate to? I'm a professor. Some of you I can see are my generation. Others of you, I'll call you students, are a student generation. We're separated by one unit of generation time. <coughs> That's what we mean by a generation, the difference between parents and their offspring. It's well known that the student generation today is about two centimeters taller on average, and this I'll emphasize, evolution is about statistics. Evolution is about populations. On average, students are about two centimeters taller than their parents across the country. And this has actually been measured by generations of incoming students in college 
in universities and colleges. It isn't done anymore because uh, it would violate our uh, civil rights or something, but uh, <laughs> what does it mean that the student generation is two centimeters taller than mine? It means that the normal curve that describes my generation here has shifted to the right here. Each of these bell-shaped curves describes stature, how tall we are, in centimeters at the bottom here and in log units here. This is a log scale at the bottom, a proportional scale at the bottom too. Here it is in log, log units and here it is uh, today. And the mean has shifted from here to here. That's a tenth of a standard deviation. We measure bell curves, how dispersed they are by standard, in standard deviation units. And that's a tenth of the way, in other words, to the inflection point. So that's a tenth of a standard deviation. Now to get there, we had to overshoot some and heritability isn't perfect and we fall back. So we have what we call a selection intensity of .2 units and we fall back to a tenth of a standard deviation is what the realized response is. Well, if you ask any anthropologist, is this evolution, they'll tell you no, it's too fast. Well, how fast is evolution? That's the question I really want to get at. Now, I don't know if this is evolution or not, increasing stature. It might be milk, it might be meat, who knows? Uh, we don't know is the truth. But it's not, not evolution because it's too fast. We're going to see that's how fast evolution is. It might be natural selection shifting human stature. Of course, what goes up can come down again and when times get tough, it will. My approach to trying to study change through time, when I started here, I started in 74, so this is a couple years into it. I started a field project in Wyoming, a place I'd worked as a student where you can collect fossils, as I'll show you in a second, bed by bed by bed by bed. The only thing you need is a lot of eyes because to find them isn't so easy. So here's the field crew from 1974. Most of them have moved on, obviously. Uh, if you go to a place like this field area, this is in northwestern Wyoming, and Yellowstone Park is back here, Hart Mountain for the geologist is right here, uh, and crawl along the bottom of this slope, you can find jaws like this. This is a fossil horse. You can climb up and crawl on this slope, go over here and crawl on this, here, 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 and we're still doing this. We focused in on some particularly interesting parts of it, but we have collections of thousands and thousands and thousands of fossils collected bed by bed by bed by bed in this basin. Now what does, what kind of a picture do you get of horse evolution by studying at this scale? Here's a graph again with time on the vertical axis in millions of years, 53.4, 53.6, 53.8, 54 million, back to 55 million, 56 million. So time is the vertical axis and we know the order of time because the beds are literally stacked up one on top of the other here. We can measure the size of a tooth and I like the first molar. I like it because it's present in most animals, even young ones usually have the first molar in. That's the one that comes in in us at six years old. Even young ones usually have that molar in if they don't have the rest. And old animals may have that too worn to measure, but usually it's not. So this is the tooth that's most often represented in a jaw like this. Here is a sample of 469 of these first molars. And I've measured the length and the width of them and then I've multiplied that to get an area and I've logged it for uh, appropriate reasons. And the plot you get, you start out with horses that are very small, about the size of a Siamese cat. We have a skeleton of one in the museum and it would stand on the table about this high. 
and the teeth are little low crowned things. Instead of big high crowned horse teeth like today, they're little low crowned things, and obviously they're pretty small um, compared to today. And this one in particular seems unusually small, and we wonder if it's really a dwarf form because of some environmental things that are happening. There's a big greenhouse global warming event right at this point, right through here, when horses first appear. And then we can trace them up through samples here. I've plotted all the individuals, 469 from 39 levels, where they occur, up through here, up through here, up through here. And then I've fit a running average to it. That's what the, the shaded area is and zigzag up the side here, the limits. And you can see them more or less staying the same and then shifting over and more or less zigging and zagging a little here but then shifting back. We can't explain yet exactly why they're doing that, but this is the pattern we see of horses changing through time on, say, a 20 or 30,000 year time scale. That's the spacing between samples. So that's still nowhere near a generational time scale. So in some sense, it's not really what we're interested in, but there's a lot of structure in a pattern like this. And you can analyze the structure in it like you would a fractal coastline by plotting the log of the rate of change from one sample to the next against the denominator of that ratio. And you see that there's structure in that and the shorter ones are changing faster than the long ones. And if we now fit a line to this and project what that's telling us about evolution on a generational time scale, that's what the intercept is here. Do we want to use this, take this literally and just say, oh, well, it's about 10 to the minus fifth standard deviations per generation? Or do we want to, seeing the, seeing the structure in this, do we want to project it as we would by regression or something as we would most other uh, patterns? and conclude that, oh, this might represent these long-term rates on different time scales might be telling us that evolution is much faster on a single generation. And here we come to a tenth of a standard deviation again. That's just what we were talking about in stature from my generation to the student's generation. Well, I don't expect you to believe an extrapolation like this by any means. But guess what? That's exactly what we see, and I don't have much of the data plotted here, but I do have some. There's some very famous experiments. Uh, Falconer's mouse selection experiment is what these dots are here on, on a single generation time scale. And these are other uh, experimental rates, lab rates. And they all cluster up here at about a tenth of a standard deviation. What biologists call microevolution, so on a 1 to 10 to 100 generation time scale. When you look at how they s stack up through time, the rates again scale with time and lead you to think, oh, evolution is up here somewhere on a generational time scale. Historical rates, things like when rats got to the Galapagos Islands when Portuguese sailors brought them and how much they've changed on the different islands since they were introduced. You get scatters of rates like this and again there's structure to them and they lead you to think that rates are faster on a single generation time scale. And here are the rates I showed you for horses plus a lot of other rates from the fossil record. And again, they give you, the whole aggregate gives you a projection of something like a tenth of a standard deviation per generation as a rate of evolution. Now what does this mean? This means evolution is fast. This means the process, natural selection, responds instantly. And of course, natural selection works on a generational time scale. It doesn't care what's going to happen next generation. It doesn't care what happened ten generations ago. It's here and now making the decision about uh, the structure of the next generation's population. And that's why it's easy to imagine natural selection making stature higher when times are good, taller, people taller when times are good, and down to Napoleon when times are tougher, as any of you know who've seen his uh, tomb or 
uh, visited Louis XIV's uh, a scene where he slept or anything, people were a lot shorter in uh, a couple hundred years ago. Here is a game board for envisioning the history of Cenozoic mammals, so mammals in the last 65 million years. And the big part of a game board, as you'd expect, has squares on it. Vertical axis is time and the horizontal axis is the morphology of mammals. And I'm going to really simplify this and I'm just going to talk about how big they are and we're going to talk about how much they weigh. How small is the smallest mammal? I'll give you a clue. They live in burrows, they go through burrows, they make burrows in the undergrowth, in the leaf litter, they make burrows the size of a pencil. Something called the least shrew that weighs about three grams. What's the biggest living mammal? I think you know that. Yeah, the great, the great blue whale is the biggest living mammal. And they weigh about what? Mm, I don't want to get this wrong, about 100 tons if I remember right. Now, what's the difference between those? How many standard deviations of mammal variability do you have to go to get from the least true to the great blue whale? Well, of course, I've done the numbers for you. The least true is three grams. That's about 1.1 units on a base E log scale. And uh, a blue whale, 10 to the eighth grams, about E to the 18. Well, if you subtract these two and divide them by the average variability for weight, coefficient of variation for weight of a typical mammal like us or a blue whale or a least true, that's about .15. You divide that out and you get that the difference between a least shrew and a blue whale is about 100 standard deviation units. 100 standard deviation units. That's 10 to the second standard deviations. How many of our rapid rate units is that? How many tenth of a standard deviation units is that? It's 10 to the third, okay. 100 standard deviations is a thousand tenth of a standard deviation units or 10 to the third. And we think, whale, we think mammals can't be bigger than a blue whale, physiologically. We think mammals can't be smaller than a least true, physiologically. There are physical limits, physiological limits to how large or small a mammal can be. And so if the whole range is 10 to the third, tenth of a standard deviation units, that's the space in which mammals, the morpho space in which mammals diversified. How does that compare with the time during which they did it? Well, we have to think a little about this. 65 million years is about roughly taking an average generation length for an average sized mammal is about 10 to the seventh generations. So if we think evolution evolves a tenth of a standard deviation per generation, what kind of a game board are we playing on? We're playing on one that's 10 to the third wide and 10 to the seventh long. That's like looking down a 10, centimeter, a 10 centimeter tube, a kilometer. That's the geometry of the game board. I've just shown you a piece of it here. It's really embedded in something that's 10 to the, s 10 to the third units wide and 10 to the seventh units long and I've cut the middle out of it and I've exaggerated it horizontally here times 100 to be able to even envision that. At that rate, if we just let it diffuse, don't even forget about natural selection which would speed things up even more, let mammals diffuse to fill the bottom of the tube. Start them here, seed them here and let them diffuse. How long is it going to take to fill the space? Just by diffusion they'll do it in about 100,000 years. 10 to the fifth, they're already, they've filled the space. Then what happens? My sense is once mammals evolve and fill the space, the story's over. They're just going to sit there and keep going, more or less. There'll be some stochastic change, but not much, probably. Things will pretty much stay the same. 
But of course, 65 million years of the Earth being the same is not what we've had. We have had all kinds of perturbations. There are all kinds of effects that the planets, here's more physics, planets, the gravitational effect of the planets on the Earth cycle our climates on time scales of 19,000 and 23,000 and 45,000 and 100,000 and 200,000 and 400,000 years and those cycles add up in, in various ways to make big climate events and small climate events on a small, small time scale. We've got El Nino that's constantly disturbing things. So the Earth has never been the same for long. When the system is perturbed, parts of it will fall apart and have to be reassembled. Fall apart and have to be reassembled. Fall apart and have to be reassembled. Now those of you, everybody is familiar with Steve Gould, you're certainly familiar with his punctuated equilibria theory and I think that's the pattern that punctuated equilibria is describing. It's not an alternative to Darwinian gradualism but it is a pattern we see in the fossil record because the system is perturbed and re-diversifies, perturbed and re-diversifies all up through Cenozoic history here. We can easily fill the space available in a short time compared to the time available, but it has happened over and over and over again as the system was perturbed. And finally we get back to whales. Here's the excavation I told you about that we did this spring. So you get a sense of the scale of the problem. Two and a half tons. Getting it here is not exactly a solution. If you can imagine two and a half tons of sediment to remove from a skeleton 50 feet long. This is where the fossil is. It's in the desert in the western part of the Fayum oasis. You can see how green and agricultural it is here. Here's the Nile River flowing north. Cairo is about here, so it's not so far. And then the delta starts a little bit farther north than that. So we're up the Nile about maybe 100 miles from Cairo. And here's, this is 50 kilometers here on the scale. So we have a concession, the University of Michigan has a concession to work this area of the western desert, 50 kilometers by about 70, something like that. And this is the dashed line here is the Wadi Rayan protected area. It's a bird sanctuary mostly and surrounding desert. And then this was added to protect the whale sites and just last summer was designated as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. So uh, this is no average place. It's due entirely, I have to be modestly I will say, to our work there that showed we didn't find it. It was found a hundred years ago, but nobody ever worked there. And when we started to work every time, more whales, more whales, more whales and beautiful ones as I'm about to show you. And uh, we've mapped something like, these dots are something like 500 whale skeletons here in every stage of exposure. Some are badly damaged now because they've been destroyed by the wind and sand, blowing sand. Others are just coming out. Next week I'm also going to excavate two more skeletons here, but small ones, not big ones like that last one. Uh, so this is the, what's called Wadi Hitan, Valley of Whales. Our interest in Basilosaurus was not because it's big, that's a nuisance. But it happens to be the first one on which we found in, in 1989, we found it had pelvic bones and upper leg bones. We knew that from one mounted at the Smithsonian collected a hundred years ago. But we found it had a knee and nobody had ever seen a knee on a whale before. And a lower leg and an ankle and a foot and toes. That's what you see in the photo at the bottom. There are, there, are, there should be two bones here and two bones here that we don't have. This is digit f five, four, three. That's all there is of digit two right there. And digit one, the big toe is completely reduced and lost in this animal. So it only had the outer toes. This is the calcaneal tuber. That's the bone of your heel that you feel if you pinch it back in the back. So big processes for muscle attachments, well muscled, 
it had a, an interesting knee in that it could be in two positions. It could either be folded like this or it could pop out, boing, and be in a second position. I won't go any further in explaining why, but you can figure that out, I think. Mating is important. <laughs> So this is how we got interested in Basilosaurus, but I never had the resources to collect one. I did collect the skull of this one in 1989. It's in the museum, in the Natural History Museum in the uh, Hall of Evolution if you want to see it. But uh, it's only when I started to work on this World Heritage Site that we got permission to go back and excavate the rest of this skeleton, and that's what this is. Unfortunately for us, they were sufficiently reduced and modified that all the ankle bones are fused together and we couldn't see anything about ankle bones, which are very informative for understanding relationships of mammals. Now what we did collect, and this is the site, you see bone here shining in the sun, was the skeleton that you'd see on exhibit across the street in the Hall of Evolution, uh, about a five meter Dorodon atrox, and we don't have all of the bones of the hind limbs here. Some are reconstructed after the ones in Basilosaurus, but we do have enough. We have the upper leg bone, the upper femur, we have a kneecap, and we have part of the ankle bones to show that they were just scaled down versions of Basilosaurus. So I think the reconstruction here has to be close to ac accurate, and the rest of the skeleton is real. Uh, it's one of about five that we have here in the museum, and there are five more like it in Cairo. Uh, though none, this is the only one that's really exhibited, has really been prepared fully for exhibit, and this is the most complete archaic whale we have. Uh, this is from the end of the Eocene, the end of that dawn recent, so it's about 40 million years ago. And we didn't find feet and toes on Basilosaurus it wasn't five minutes after we found them. I mean, we found them over a course of a couple of days, but when we finally got to the ankles and toes, my thoughts went back to Pakistan where I'd worked before, because there we had left hip bones and joked about them being walking whales in the 70s. We joked about it because it was unbelievable. I thought evolution would be too fast, you know me. I thought evolution would be too fast, and we would never see the legs of whales being reduced. We would never see the transition from land to sea because it would happen too fast to see it. But when we found whales in Egypt with legs and feet and toes, I realized, ah, we can study this problem. And so we started work in 1991 in Pakistan to try to find better skeletons of the things we'd, we'd found there in the 70s. In the 70s, I found an animal called Pachycetus that's still not very well known. I'll show you that in just a second. And in 1991, we found the animal named Rhodocetus, and we found a better one in 2000, year 2000, when we found this animal called Artiocetus, and this shows where they come from. Now, Rhodo, I should explain, you can almost see it here. There's a white patch showing on the Landsat image. It was found at the edge of a big dome of limestone of a mountain called Rhodo. Now, and we might think this means red something. It doesn't. Rhodo in Urdu and in the local languages means bald. So this big bald limestone dome is called Rhodo because it's bald. And that's how Rhodocetus got its name, as it was found at the edge of this big bald dome of limestone. If you're interested, this is the area that we hear about in the news all the time, uh, the tribal belt where Osama bin Laden is, is uh, collecting whales, I hope. <laughs> okay, just a word about Pachycetus. On the left is the, is the principal element of it we found. It's the back of a skull here embedded in some plaster for preparation. This is what it looks like drawn in full, and here it is reconstructed into a skull. Uh, I'll warn you that a former student of mine reconstructed it into a skeleton recently based on a few very, very, very fragmentary and inadequate bones to reconstruct a skeleton. He thinks it's a land mammal that's gotten a lot of press, and I don't believe it for a minute. 
so our focus in the next three years, we have an NSF grant to work in Pakistan. Our focus is to try to find real skeletons of this thing and see what it really was like or hopefully even earlier things. Here's the skeleton found here I say 1992. I started in 1991. We found this in 1992 and published it in 1994. Very good skeleton of one of these more primitive whales. The only problem is no arms, no hands, no legs and feet. Here's an upper leg bone, a femur, no tail. And we worked 10 years, not every year, but for a period of about 10 years until year 2000, finding more and more skeletons like this that didn't have the parts we wanted. And then happily in 2000, we crossed a mountain range, worked in a completely new area. It looked awful. And the very first morning, Iyad Zamut brought an astragalus bone uh, that was exactly what we were looking for. And we came back that year with the rest of that skeleton from 1992, the same kind of animal, except for the end of the tail. And I'm happy to say Iyad has found that in uh, 2003. He came back with, the, with a complete skeleton now uh, with the tail intact. So we now know what that looks like too, except that the better the fossils are, the more time and effort and money it takes to prepare them. And we're taking far too long with this, I know. but. Uh, we just can't make it go faster. The, the whale is too good. Here's a reconstruction of what Rhodocetus probably looked like by John Klausmeyer of the Exhibit Museum. And uh, he's put some flesh on it. And I had him superimpose the skeleton there just to give us a sense of what it's based on. Here's the icon, one of the icons for the evolution theme semester. This, again, is a, a drawing by John Klausmeyer uh, that was on the cover of Science when it was published in 2001. Now, you don't get an illustration on the cover of Science for finding yet another whale skeleton. What made this so special, you have to understand. To understand what made this so special and made it a cover story, you have to understand what an astragalus is. And I feel you should know this because each of you have two of them. But you probably don't think of them. They're the bone in your ankle that lets the ankle hinge. They're the, the, the hinge joint in your ankle. And the interesting thing about these bones is that most of our, many of our domesticated animals, cows, sheep, goats, have not one hinge but two in their principal ankle bone, the bone called the astragalus. And here it is in various forms. This is a, a sheep astragalus laid out in, on different sides showing different facets. These are more famous than you might think. They're icons of art in, the, in uh, ancient Greece. They are the source of the game called jacks, where you drop things and count how they're lying. They are the source of games of chance using die. So these evolved directly from astragali of these particular kinds of animals called artiodactyls, the split-hooved or even-toed ones that turn out to be the ones we eat the most, like cows and sheep and goats and things. OK. One of the theories about the origin of whales, a biochemical theory, an immunological theory, it started out, and then a lot of DNA sequencing helped us understand it better is that whales are related to these animals that have this kind of a foot, cows, sheep, goats. Well, that didn't make any sense, to be honest. And I was very skeptic skeptical because whales eat meat. And all these animals we're talking about with the split, split, split hoof and the astragalus like this eat plant food. And I honestly didn't believe it. And I was out, among other things. The reason I was looking for these astragalus bones so avidly, so anxiously, was I wanted to disprove it. Of course, it was odd that the biochemists kept, molecular systematists kept getting this answer. And that first morning in 2000, in the year 2000, Iyad brought me this. And we went back to the site, and Munir al Haq picked up this. And I fooled with them in my hands, and click, they fit together. And I went, oh my god. Because here is one of the hinge joints, and here is the other one. 
Here's a pronghorn antelope for comparison. Here's one of the hinge joints and here's the other one. And this is double pulleyed, as we call it, just like an artiodactyl. And then we found the ankle of Rhodocetus about a week later. Uh, we couldn't see it in the field, but when we got it back here and prepared it, it's even better matched to this. It's longer because the foot is longer, but otherwise the trochlea here at the top is like this, not quite as deep, but very similar, and the trochlea at the other end is pretty much like this, and there's a facet here for the fibula on both of these. Right here it is. I forgot the arrow. Uh, here it is on the pronghorn, and there's a notch for the calcaneum in the cuboid here and here, and also quite prominent over here. So I don't think there's any question anymore. The molecular biologists are right about, and the systematists are right about this. Whales are most closely related to artiodactyls. Now, how do you get whales out of artiodactyls? I thought I had the final figure that we used in the exhibit, but it turned out I didn't. So here's a draft of it that John Klausmeyer put together. If you want to see the final figure, go to the exhibit uh, in the exhibit museum. And this shows again how paleontologists think. We've got time on the vertical axis, form on the horizontal axis, and uh, diversification of whales up through time. Now, finally, just to summarize, we start with an artiodactyl ancestor, fine. We don't yet have that one, but we have some we can use as models. So we start here. A terrestrial anthracothere is what the group we think is the kind of artiodactyl, and they do give rise to hippos later. So that part might be, might be correct. But they first give rise to a foot-powered semi-aquatic mammal, Rhodocetus and a whole protoceted group that it belongs to. And here's a, a living foot-powered uh, water mole, a thing called Desmona, or this happens to be Galemes, which is a close relative, uh, to give you a sense of what a mammal looks like that, that swims by paddling with its hind feet. That's what these were. And here they've shifted Dorodon, Basilosaurus, our tail-powered swimmers that are like modern whales today. So we know three stages of this series. That's two more than we knew before. But of course, you want to see and I want to see what happened here and what happened here. And so that's the focus of our research going forward. Science is never finished. Now if we come back to the five points, Earth and life have changed, evolution preceded Darwin, Charles Darwin was a geolo geologist as a young man. Evolution as a process is fast. And finally, whales evolved backward to the sea. What does it mean that whales evolved backward? It means that evolution isn't orthogenetic. It isn't preordained. It isn't something that has momentum. It's opportunistic. Every generation makes its own. The decisions are made for every generation. and. If the food is in the sea, someone eventually will find it, and that's what whales did. So that's what's important about whale evolution being backwards, going back to the sea. It illustrates on a big scale how opportunistic evolution is. And finally, I just want to acknowledge a series of people. Uh, Iyad Zalmud has taken a lot of responsibility for field work. Bill Sanders and a lot of U of M students for preparation of fossils. Bonnie Milger and Cla John Klausmeyer for illustrations. And then uh, we've been well funded, by, especially by National Geographic and by a National Science Foundation. And I'm grateful for that. And I've talked a little too long, uh, but thanks for your indulgence. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program.